Jesus and reign with him above and shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning and from the flowing fountain drink everlasting love and shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning. Well, for those of us who would like to open up in a word of prayer, those who. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you so much, Father, for an opportunity once again to come into congregation, Lord God, with dear friends um, that we've met in the past to come back to this camp meeting. We thank you for the Smiths, Lord God, for blessing them, Lord God, with the ability to be able to bring those of the same mindset together, Lord, that we may once again endow and dig into the scriptures to find those sacred truths, Lord God, to walk and to run to and fro through the scriptures, Lord God. Lord God, to bring that enlightenment upon us, Lord. I pray for this morning session, Lord, um, for those of us that are here, that we may have a clearer understanding of preparation. I thank you, Lord, that um, you're leading us and guiding us. And take away from me, O oh Lord. Let your Holy Spirit, Lord God, speak through me, O oh Lord God. Lord, I pray that uh, I may not be a stumbling block, O oh Lord, but that your name may be lifted on high, Lord God. I pray for others that are coming, that they may be safe. I pray for our families and our friends, those uh, that were unable to make it, oh Lord God. But Father, mostly, my deep heartfelt prayer goes for our equipment, oh Lord. We know that the enemy is busy. Lord God, that um, he doesn't want these words to get out. But I pray, Lord God, that you will cover the equipment, the sound system, the cameras. Lord God, that we won't have any defects, Lord God, during this entire session. We pray and ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Um, Everybody knows my name is Brother Butler, and it's nice to see um, some old faces and some new ones. Uh, This week, this um, theme that I was told um, that we're going to be doing um, for this camp meeting is called Preparation. And when Wesley called me and asked me to um, do one of the presentations, I was a little thrown back, uh, actually a little frightened about it at first. But I prayed and God asked God, I said, Father, you have to help me with this one about preparation. And I started to think about, um, you know, what are the things that we prepare for in life? What are some of the things that we prepare for? Anybody? Winter, we prepare for winter, and what else? Anything else? Huh? Storms, hurricanes, Storms, hurricanes is something we prepare for. Prepare for, the end of the world. prepare for the end of the world. Yes. And, you know, all good answers. And when I was going through and I was thinking about it, I was thinking about it, I said, you know, I, I, first thing that really came to mind was marriage, that we prepare for marriage. I was going to say that. that <laughs> family and children. But you know, all of these things that we prepare for are Bible things. God has prepared all of these things when we read through the scripture. We read Matthew 25, right? We talk about the the bridegroom. We read about the wedding feast. So these things God has prepared us for. But then I want to look at it in preparedness in terms of a pathetic sense. How how did God teach us to be prepared? What was he showing us in the book of Genesis to the book of Revelations? And um, one of the first scriptures that I would like to turn to, and if it's possible, if I can get a reader on this one, I'd appreciate it. It's in um, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. If someone can read that for me, I'd appreciate that. Appreciate it. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. If I can get a read on that one. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, I counsel shall stand, and I will do all by faith. 
Amen. So, you know, first of all, God is telling us to remember. And I love how we put that in. Remember the former things of old. So, from ancient times, God has set a line of preparation for humanity. And I was reading here, the Holy Spirit led me to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse um, 7 and 8 and 9. 7, 8, and 9. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, 8, and 9. And it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, I ask myself, what does this passage of Scripture have to do with preparation? But that's a golden weave, golden thread running through all, throughout the Scriptures. As I went through the Bible, one theme that I continuously see is relationship with humanity with the garden. God calls Jesus, you know, in many parts of the Scripture, he talks about the fig tree which was in the garden. He talks about the vine, um, the olive leaves, uh, the fruits of the Spirit. And this is where God is trying to prepare us. And in preparation um, for the end times, I want to read this quotation from um, Sister White in Consuls to the Church. It said, now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It would never be placed upon the forehead of, a, of the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. It would never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God, candidates for heaven. Go forward, my brethren and sisters, I can only write briefly upon these points at this time, merely calling your attention to the, to the necessity of preparation. Search the scriptures for yourselves that you may understand the fearful solemnity uh, of the present hour. In this scripture here where you know, God has placed Adam and Eve in the garden, and in our time, of course, you know, the perverseness of the world after the flood, God gave Noah uh, the emergency diet of eating meat. Um, and it's something that he was, his thought, I guess, at that time was that, you know, they'll eat the meat at that time and they'll go back to the health, eating healthy. But this didn't happen. Of course, you know, man got into eating meat and so forth. And in the book of Isaiah 66, 17, God sends us right back to the garden. He's telling us, go back to the garden. He says, for those that purify and sanctify themselves in the garden behind the one tree. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Brother, he's talking about also, uh, you know, the, the beginning from the end, and I was looking at it verse, uh, chapter, Genesis 1, mm -hmm. chapter 1, verse 29 reads, and God says, you know what I do to every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree which gives with the fruit, and the tree be in the seed to you, it shall be uh, for me. And I'm thinking, after the book of Genesis, we're in the book of Revelation, or the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Gardening is going to become a very important thing. Amen. And I, and, I, and I look at that, and I say, well, he's preparing this at the beginning for what's going to happen at the end. end. It's the same thing. The scripture that was read just now was uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. And uh, the statement was talking about what's, what's in the is happening in the beginning, and it's the same thing that's going to happen in the end. And this same garden scene is going to be the garden scene that's placed before us in heaven, that God is preparing us for. And as we continue to go on here, 
Um, I want to read here. Jump down to three of the six. Let's go that way. Um, when Christ went out, no, nope, that's not where I want to go here. I'm sorry. Here, um, there's another quotation I want to read just before I move on. This is from um, Today with God. And it says, the question is asked, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? What shall we do to gain heaven? This important question is answered to all who desire to know this work of God that E, believe on him whom he had sent, John 6, 29. One of the things for preparation is that God wants us to prepare our hearts, our minds, our soul, and our body. The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, thy heart, and thy soul. And the second is like unto it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. For us to be in Christ and Christ in us, to have that Christ-like spirit. And from the garden... God has given man purity, purity of heart, purity of mind, purity of soul. And it's the same thing that he's trying to direct us to in these last days, to purify ourselves, to cleanse ourselves, um, not for us to cleanse ourselves, but through Christ that we can be cleansed from all purity of unrighteousness, to purify our bodies. Um, I think it's in Isaiah, and I can be wrong, somebody can help me out, uh, Isaiah 65, I think it it is when it talks about uh, the defilement of meat. And it talks about, you know, a man that killed an ox. It's like killing a man, you know. So these things God is telling us that, you know, we need to get away from, from the meat eating and get back into the plant base that we can purify our, our bodies and uh, have, have them purify our souls to be cleansed. Um, one of the things that I found really profound and inter very interesting is that in order to partake of something, we need to be a part of something. And in Revelations, Revelations 22, verse 14, going to the end, Revelations 22, verse 14, God made a solemn promise to us. And he says that, Revelations 22, 14, says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into heaven. So, here it is, God is telling us once again, even in heaven, in order to partake of that tree of life, we have to prepare our hearts. We would be going through basically the same things that happened in the beginning, back to the garden. In Christ's day, when Christ came, he um, commissioned his 70 disciples to go out. And one of the things that, um, as I was reading this story about the preparation of the 70, are the things that, how they represent us today, especially in the last days when the, during the close of probation, when Christ sent, commissioned his 70 disciples to go out, the things that he told them what not, uh, actually the 12, but he told them what not to take with them, as far as taking um, any money, <laughs> don't worry about... Uh, Taking, see. He says, go your way, behold, I send forth, I send you forth as lambs among wolves, carry neither purse, nor scrap, nor shoes, and sal salute no man by the way, and into whatsoever house he enter, first say, peace be to this house, and if the son, and if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house again, remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his heart. Of his heart. Go forth from house to house and into whatsoever city he entered. And they receive, and they receive you, eat such things as, you, as they set before you. Let's repeat it there. So God in the end times is setting us out 
these times right now to go, up, go forward that we can not only prepare our hearts and our minds, but we need to help prepare others also. Amen. We have a work that's set before us um, because the enemy is out there right now, and he's busy. He's trying to bring down as many um, against the message of God that we have to prepare for. He's distorting the minds of families, friends, uh, even right within our own congregations, within the churches. There are separations that's coming, that's, um, that's coming about. That is happening right now within the churches. How are we preparing ourselves for these things? How are we preparing our hearts and our minds? How are we, um, what are we doing to actually stand up for God? One of the scriptures that um, came to mind to me was in, um, in Revelation 12, where God warned us, he prepared us, that the devil has come down, and he's coming down with such a wrath. And he's angry, he knows, but he has for a short time. And in the book of Ephesians, if we can turn to Ephesians chapter 6, well, once again, it talks about preparation. In Ephesians chapter 6, if somebody can read Ephesians 6, uh, verse, verse 10 through 16. I'm sorry, verse 10 through um, 17. Amen. So here in verse 15, it tells us that on your feet shrode, shrod with, uh, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So God wants us to prepare, you know, wherever we go, just like he told the disciples here in, in Matthew, to go into various cities, various houses, and have that peace about them, that calmness. Have that Christ-like spirit, the fruits of the spirit, which is taught, you know, love, peace, joy, happiness, the fruits of the spirit that we ought to have. We ought to have on the breastplate of righteousness. Um, God is trying, to, he's, he's preparing us. He wants us to be prepared that when we go out there to battle, we can stand, withstand the enemy. And as I read earlier from the quotation from Sister, Sister White, she says that, you know, we ought to study for ourselves and we ought to um, endow into God's word, indulge into it daily. Um, <coughs> also, here, as we see um, sticking in, in Ephesians, uh, she says, it, Paul also tells us here in Ephesians that in verse 18, we didn't read that one, it says, put always in prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching therefore with all uh, preserve preference and supplication of all saints. So we ought to be praying once again also for one another in love and in charity. So, a question to each of you, what preparation, or what, what do you see as being the, one of your key elements of preparation for the times that we're in right now? I, I frequently pray that the Lord will help me to keep the sin out of my life. Mm-hmm. Amen.
heard his word and believe what he said and hold on to that. Amen. So, so we pray to help get sins out of our life and pray also to get doubt. Because doubt, you know, that doubt that sits in our hearts can bring a shroud of darkness. It can bring um, delusions. And that's all Satan needs is just a little teeny, any bit of doubt that we have against God's word that we have. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. And as he teaches in the book of Revelations, you know, those that overcome, those that endure until the end. And that's what we want, to be able to endure until the end. To be able to wear that crown that's being fashioned for us from the foundation of the world. You know, any other? For preparation? No? You know, we have to also, you know, look at scripture because, you know, Amos tells us he says that uh, God asked Amos a question. Amos, what see is thou? He said, I see a basket of summer fruit. Thou see is, see is right. He says, I'm not passing by anymore. So all of these answers as pertaining to our preparedness are the things that we need to search within ourselves and ask God to help us with. We need to pray. Because, you know, in the dark hidden chambers of the heart, the secret chambers of the heart, who can know it but God? This is where lies those deep, dark sins. The outward sins are there. We can pray for those. You know, some of the things we, we, you know, we can get over. The drinking, the smoking, the this, the that. But it's the little darling sins that we hold on to. Those little fruits, as described um, in, uh, what's it, First Peter, when it talks about, it talks about the other, the, the other fruits of the spirit, you know, the hallmongers, the liars, the sorcerers, you know, the things that we ho- that, that's still in there, the little hatred, the little bickering and backbiting. These are the sins that God wants to be us. He wants us to allow him to come in and remove out of us, to prepare us. He wants, he wants us to have the ripened fruits. He wants us to have those fruits that are good enough to be able to put into that basket. I know sometimes I, 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 I go by a fruit tree and I look and I said, wow. You know, I look at a fruit and um, it looks real good, ready to pick, ready to eat. And then when you pick it, you look on the end, just on one side of it, on the next side, it's a little brown spot, a little worm or something that's in there. It's not good enough to go in the basket. Then other times, you, you know, you walk around the tree, you look, there's fruits on the ground that fell off, that's no good. They just couldn't endure. And then you pick one that's just right. And those are the, that's the fruit that God is looking for. One person told me that I fear them. You do what? I fear. You fear? Hmm. Fear? Yeah. Well, we, all, we have our fears there. Um, mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, I think somebody mentioned, I'm not quite sure about, you know, um, trusting. You know, that fear is, is, is trusting God and, 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 and putting our trust in him, that he take away that fear. Go ahead, Doris. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Flesh and blood. Amen. You know, 
Go ahead. Our preparation abilities are finite. Mm -hmm. They are. Mm -hmm. You know, when you read that, I actually was going to kind of expound upon verse 12, but um, and Doris brought up about fear. And when you read that, it you know, brought to mind <coughs> Psalms 91. <laughs> you know, Psalms 91, beautiful, beautiful psalm that was written. You know, it said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. So that takes away the fear. And, you know, it goes on so beautifully. And God, like you said, um, you're talking about, you know, as you read through the rest of that um, and trying to understand, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, and when it talks about spiritual wickedness in high places, which high places is he talking about? You know, typically we always think about the world when we think about the high places. But let's just look right within the walls. You know, you go to Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel 9. You know, those high places right there. <laughs> right within the walls of Israel and Jerusalem. Right within the congregation. Those that have turned their backs, they teach the truth in unrighteousness. Amen. And we're, we're seeing it daily. You know, I was talking about uh, a, a brother, and um, he was one of the leading, leading guys when I first came in to Adventism, when I first started the camp meetings. He's in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, t uh, Timothy puts it uh, in a real good way. He says that some will depart, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Wickedness in high places. Jesus tells us best, uh, not Jesus, um, Daniel. Daniel 12. We talk about the wicked would do wickedly and only the wise will understand. Wickedness in high places. But we wrestle, we wrestle not against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And um, I read earlier uh, Revelations 12. In Revelations 12, um, <coughs> and he says that in Revelations 12, 15 and six, 16, Revelations 12, 15 and 16, it says, and the serpent cast out, no, I'm sorry, Revelations 12, um, I'm sorry, verse 9, verse 9. It says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, <clears throat> and the verse that I'm trying to find here is, um, yeah, so anyway, so he was cast out into the earth. So we know that the devil and his imps are cast into this earth. The principalities of darkness are cast here. But God has given us, you know, the preparation He's given us the means to withstand, to hold up against these principalities of darkness, to, hold, to stand up against the, the wickedness in high places. He's given us the light. His word is a light unto my path and a word unto, un, a light unto my feet and a word unto my path. God has given us his word. And he's also given us these different preparations. He tells us here in verse um, 14, stand therefore having your learns girded with Truth having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shrouded with preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all taking the shield of faith, 
wherewith we shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The fruits of the Spirit in preparation, God wants us to be able to stand against those that are fighting against his truths, his word of, of truth. Christ has <coughs> come down, he's come down here um, to earth as, as a human, and he has gone through all that we have gone through to teach us, to show us that we can overcome the bitterness, the anger, the wrath, the strife, the backbiting. He's showing us that we can do away with all these bad fruits. Because he tells us right here, he says, you know, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, which is what Christ has. Love, the love of God, the love of humanity, the love of our neighbors, the love, the joy, the peace, long-suffering. We are going to, we are going to go through much. We are going to have to in, endure quite a bit. Go ahead, brother. Amen. Yes, amen. You know, you, you mentioned about the camp meetings. I remember when my wife and I first came in and we started going to camp meetings about, what, about nine years ago. You know, there were, there were quite a bit of camp meetings. You know, you, you could basically pick and choose which one you wanted to go to. You know, <laughs> sometimes they were, they were so close together. You know, now they're like, phew, few, far in between. You know, um, we're, we're searching online, trying to find camp meetings. You don't find them. They're hardly there anymore. And um, when I first became an Adventist 11 years ago, you know, one of the claim to fame to Adventism. One of the most favorite scriptures that I, I, that I always used to hear. Revelations 12, 17. You know, devil was robbed with the woman and went to, make, went to make war with the remnant of a seed. The remnant, we're the remnant, we're the remnant, we're the remnant. You know, the church that, that's about to fall, but it doesn't. You know, don't abandon the ship. And, you know, these were the, the great quotes that I heard from all the, you know, people in the conference churches. But as I searched, went through and through scripture, you know, one of the things that really kind of struck, struck hard with me was the word remnant. And I did a search on remnant. And I, and I remember as I went back to Jeremiah, there was a remnant that was left out of Babylon. And they said, well, go and inquire of the Lord. What would he have us to do? And I said, okay. Jeremiah went and he inquired of the Lord. And he came back and the Lord says, Stay out here in the country. Let's build. Let's start over. Let's, you know, let's become back the children of God. Let's go back to the commandments. But he looked at Jeremiah as if though he was a lunatic. Man, I don't know which God you talk to, but we're going back to Egypt. They get the leeks, the melons, the fish, the same words that they're forefathers had said when Moses took them out into the wilderness. That's where they wanted to go. But out of that remnant, there was a remnant that was left. Because God destroyed a lot of them. But we know that that remnant didn't make it. And it's the same thing today. Those that call themselves the remnant, are they truly the remnant? Are they true, the true church? Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. It doesn't, have a label. it doesn't, you know. One, one, one of the, one of the. How can I put this? In chastisement, because we have a home church. In chastisement, and I've, I've come across, I've come across this quite a bit from ministers and different people within the within the conference area, is that, you know, having a home church, and as as you brought up. 
the main question that I always ask, or I always put before them, show me from the spirit of the prof from the spirit of prophecy and from the word of God what constitutes a church. Amen. And Ellen White says, Christ and Christ alone Amen. can constitute us. What is a church? Amen. Where two or three are gathered, the faithful few, there he would be. Amen. That's God's true church. It's not the great cathedrals. It's not the masses, the big congregations. He says faithful few. And I always, always, it always comes to mind about when Christ walked upon the earth, I always read the stories about how many Christ healed. The Bible says, I mean, they couldn't even number the amount of healings that Christ did. They could not, I mean, the multitudes, you know, we, we have a little, and I always tell people, give God the glory. It says in Matthew, because Matthew was an accountant, he's always into numbers, when he talks about the feeding on the, on the, on the mound, he says he fed 5,000 men besides women and children. And I always tell people, I say, give God just a little bit of glory. If we took one man, one woman, that's 10,000. They are children. If we take one man, one woman, one child, that's 15,000. But there was more women than there were men, and there was more children than there were men and women. So that's just giving God a little bit of glory. So, you know, when I look at it, and I say, well, we look at the masses, in a lot of these churches, and we think, well, oh, you know, things must be going on real good there. And this guy, whoever this preacher is, he's preparing those hearts. He's getting those hearts ready for heaven. You know, he's directing them in the right path, and these people, they're, they're learning something great. But when we get down to the end of Christ's life, there was a multitude there in the courtyard. There was a great multitude. Many of those, I'm quite sure, were those that were healed, that were fed, that that saw the workings of God. But when the cry went out, Barabbas or Jesus? There was a crowd to cry, Barabbas. Crucify him, crucify him. You could hardly hear that rumor for the, for the cries and the shouts. You know, and Jeremiah puts it best. He says, the summer has ended, the harvest has passed, and we're not yet saved. So our hearts have to be prepared. We, we have to seek God while he may yet be found in all facets of our lives. And I ask God to help me daily. And like he said, for those small doubting sins that sits in my heart, help me to overcome my shortfalls. Strengthen me in my weak areas where he's strong. Give me the strength. Help me to become strong to be prepared for what's about to come. As, as we look and see daily, in a secular fashion, more and more we're seeing that we are at the ends of time. Amen. More and more we can see each day prophecy being fulfilled. The world as we know it is changing right before our eyes. God wants us to be prepared Amen. for a time that we can endure that we can endure what's about to come upon us. And the question is, are we ready? How are you going to stand? How are you going to hold forth when someone comes and spit in your face, and someone comes and take things from you? How is your mindset going to be? And if we can't deal with the small things now, you know, do we have that anger? Do we have that bitterness in us? Are we still able to say, you know, brother, you know, no problem, I love you. Are we still able to say that? Is our hearts prepared? And this is what God's trying to help us with, that fruit of the Spirit. And um, one of the other stepping ladders that we have to go through is that faith. It says, add to your faith, that virtue. And I always look up that, I try to understand a fine virtue. Um, and I found different meanings of virtue. One of the things, one of the main things I found with virtue is strength. 
you know, with that faith, the foundation. We need a strong foundation. If the foundation be destroyed, what would the righteous do? We have to have a good foundation. And upon that foundation, we need strong pillars. If the pillars aren't strong, the building's going to fall. And God gave us the 12 pillars. He gave us the pillars of our, you know, of our faith. So, and upon that, the brotherly kindness, because trying to build a house by yourself, I'm going to tell you, I do it. It's a hard thing. You need help. Brotherly kindness. Patience and temperance. And above all, charity. These are the fruits that God has given us to go forward with. Okay. So, anybody like to add anything else in there? In the fruits of the Spirit or preparation? No? Pray, pray, pray. Pray, pray, pray. That's right. I want to read one last quote. I want to close out here. This is from Ellen White. Um, and as I was reading this, I was telling um, Wesley this morning about it. And, um, and I think this, this, this particular quotation that Ellen White wrote here, it really struck me hard because um, about a year ago, or six, several months ago, I was listening to a, one of, you know, SDA leading ministers give a, an answer to a, a biblical question. And in part, it had to do with preparation. It had to do with how do I find truth? Where do I seek it out? Where in the Bible can I go to have a clearer understanding of how I, can, how I can truly prepare my heart, how God has actually directed me. And this, um, I think what had happened was that he said he was doing a study and somebody's reading from a different Bible. And his Bible and the wording, it was different. So there was a little confusion. There was a little disagreement because of different wording. And Ellen White wrote this in Early Writings 220.1. And she says, Then I saw that God knew that Satan would try every art to destroy man. Therefore he had caused his word to be written out. Because remember in the, in the beginning, when Satan came to Eve, did not God say, And had made his purpose in regard to the human race so plain that the, weak, the weakest need not err after having given his word to man. And during the days of the Jews of old, it was just the leading men that would learn, the learn, the leaders who would read the scriptures, who would read the prophets of old. And even through the dark ages, if you were found with a Bible, you were put to death. So you couldn't read. But God says that um, in regard to the human race, so plain that the weakest need not error after having given his word, he had carefully preserved it from destruction by Satan or his angels or by any of his, a any of his um, agents or representatives. While other books might be destroyed, this was to be immortal. And near the close of time, when the delusions of Satan should increase, it was to be so multiplied that all who desire might have a copy, and if they would, might arm themselves against the deceptions and lying wonders of Satan. Arm themselves. The scripture that was read was read from Ephesians. Put on the whole armor of God. And she goes on to say, and I thought this was so precious. <laughs> I saw that God had especially guarded the Bible. And you know there's so many different versions of Bibles out there. New King James, NIV, American, English, this, that, you know. 
And it's just that little twist, that little twist in words that changes the whole concept of a statement that's being made. You know, I have a thing um, when somebody says something and we repeat it. Do we ever repeat it exactly the way it was said? We always twist it. We always add to it or we take away. We're never exact. And this is what God wants us to be. He wants us to be exact. In fact, he wants us to be so exact, he tells us in Revelation, he says, don't add and don't take away. You quote that exactly the way it is. Don't add or take away. That's why I gave this to you in such a plain way that you don't need to add or take away. You don't need to exemplify it. You don't need to break it down. You don't need to, to pacify it or make it smooth. Just tell it the way it is because I said it. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was of God. <coughs> and nothing was made without God. I saw that God had especially guarded the Bible, yet when copies of it were few, learned men had in some instance changed the words, thinking that they were making it more plain, when in reality they were mystifying that which, that which was plain by causing it to be lean. To their established views, which were governed by tradition, but I saw that the word of God as a whole is a perfect chain, one portion linking into and explaining another. True seekers of truth need not error for not only is the word of God plain and simple in declaring the way of life, but the Holy Spirit is given as a guide in understanding the way, of, the way to life therein revealed. Early writings, 220.1. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I'm going to stop there. We can close out with a word of prayer. Yeah. Brother, you mind saying a word of prayer for us, please? You pray for us? Yeah. Uh huh. Yes, sir. And for those who 